Genesis uh, 37 is where we'll be in just a second. And uh, I wanted to start out uh, tonight talking about the, the life of one of the men in the Bible, one of my favorite Bible characters, Joseph, and some lessons that, that, I, uh, that I have pulled from, from Joseph's life and things that I have learned uh, just from studying his story and studying his life. I was reminded as I prepared, I was reminded of a statement that I've heard Brother Woosley give in our, in our junior high chapel even. He would, uh, he would say, one of the greatest things, one of the greatest ways that we can learn and one of the greatest teachers in life is experience. And instead of it being your experience, why don't you let it be somebody else's experience? And uh, taking the opportunity to learn from other people's lives, uh, the things that I can learn without having to experience some of the heartaches and some of the trouble and some of the trials that people experience unnecessarily. Um, in the story of Joseph, a very upright man, a very good man, and hopefully we can pull some of the ideas here from his life um, out, and I hope that I can somehow be a blessing. An old man going a lone highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream had no fear for him, but he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you are wasting strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again will pass this way. You've crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build you this bridge at the evening tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I have come, he said, there followeth after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm that has been naught to me to that fair-haired youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I am building this bridge for him. And today, a very, um, even a very sobering thought. I remember hearing uh, Brother Hiles give that, um, that poem many times, and many of you who were here for, for years and years before have heard that poem many times. And uh, that thought right there, the bridge builder, is exactly what Joseph's life was. His, his life was building a bridge and he didn't probably see it, didn't understand it for the longest of time, but eventually came to the realization that his life's purpose was the preservation of a people that uh, to him at the time probably looked like the greatest of trial, that was the greatest of unfair treatment of a person you can possibly imagine. And yet Joseph still uh, remained faithful. Genesis chapter 37, if you wouldn't mind, verses 1 through 7. And uh, you can stay seated if you'd like. Um, why don't we all just stay seated so there's not half standing and half seated. All right. One through seven. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And that story right there, those seven verses, of course, it continues on and talks about his second dream that he had. And the story of Joseph, I, I love to read the story of Joseph, and I love to, to uh, take truths from the story of Joseph. And the, the, the study of the story of Joseph is a study on, I'm going to point out just four things tonight. And hopefully I'll, be, hopefully I'll be quick. I think I will be. I don't preach very long. I'm used to preaching in teen church to the, uh, the A-bus kids, and uh, they normally, their attention span is pretty minuscule. And so uh, I imagine many of you are about the same, uh, same level, so hopefully I'll be fast. Uh, I'm talking about your attention span. Anyway, um, faith, number one, Joseph's story is a study on faith. That's my first point. Hebrews 11, 22, the Bible says, by faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Faith. The life of faith, A, to accomplish the God-given dreams for your life. Joseph's life was a life of faith, and he had to understand that his life was meant to accomplish the God-given dreams that were given to him. He had these dreams. And you and I, you know, in the story of, uh, in the, story of the Christmas Carol, 
Um, Ebenezer Scrooge says it may just be a bit of undigested beef that was uh, causing him to dream that night and see those visions. But Joseph didn't have a bit of undigested beef in his stomach. He was getting some God-given dreams. And Joseph was receiving these dreams from the Almighty. And that what an opportunity that he had. Years ago, one of England's most exclusive grocery stores, Fortnum and Mason in London's Piccadilly District, advertised for a new chocolate taster, including a salary of $54,000 a year. This dream job consists of traveling the world, sampling as much chocolate as possible, and selecting the very best for the store's discerning customers. Talk about a dream. And you look at that, that job right there, man, that's a dream job. For almost everybody in the world, that would be only a dream. You know, nobody, nobody gets that job. Disney World has based their entire theme, the basis of their whole production is on dreams. If you've ever been to these amusement parks or the, the Disney theme parks, you sit there and you watch the beautiful play at Magic Kingdom in front of the castle. It's so magical. And uh, after you just pay $95 for entrance and, and you watch the, the magical play and, and Mickey comes out, have a dream, and he's all excited. And, and all the kids are sitting there watching and man, they're pumped up. And, uh, you know, I have small children, seven, six, four, one, so we're watching all, I mean, Tangled. Uh, it's, it's totally based on a dream. And uh, she gets to sing the song, I've got a dream, I've got a dream. I just long to see those golden lanterns gleam or whatever it is. And, and she's all pumped about this dream. I bet I could bring Lexi up, she could sing it for me. But, um, and with every passing hour, I'm so glad I left my tower. All right, I'll stop. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of dreams. And, and you look at Disney, they've based their whole, their whole existence on dreams. You know, they're playing off the dreams of little children and have a dream, and it's all excitement. But those types of dreams compared to what Joseph had, Joseph's not just in the middle of the night, woke up from a weird dream where 25 things from the, from the previous week all mixed together in one weird thing at night, you know, and you have all these different dreams that you have. Joseph was a vision of what God could do with him someday. And he looked at those, those sheaves standing there, and he watched them all as they bowed down to him. And as a 17-year-old kid, he probably just thought, cool. You know, my brothers are going to worship me, man. You know, isn't that cool? And so here's a 17-year-old boy thinking, all my brothers are going to bow down and worship me. And I wish I could take him and transplant him at 30, because that's when, that's when it comes true. But, you know, he's going to have to go through 13 years of frustration before he ever gets to see anything good happen from this dream. And from the other dream where the sun, moon, and stars are all bowing down to him. And his father has to get on his case. Yet at the same time, he remembers that statement. He thinks about it and mulls it over his head. What drives us to excel? What motivates us to do more for him? Joseph's dream could have been viewed as selfish. And he didn't understand probably the dynamics of the dream's fulfillment. But he knew God was showing him an opportunity. And it was up to him to do what was necessary to find it. God gave him the dream, but now he had to do something about it. It's not a dream that scares you or confuses you, but a vision of what can, God can do through you sometimes scares us and confuses us. And those dreams are, are very potent, very important. Secondly, the faith to pursue the dream through difficulty. Joseph met with some hard times. Look at verse number five, the second part there. It says, they hated him yet the more. He's supposed to have brothers that are excited for him. Come on, guys, rejoice with them that do rejoice. And they didn't want to rejoice with him. He told them about the dream, and they all hated him the more. And it says three different times in this passage that they hated him, they hated him more, and they hated him even more. I mean, it got bad. You think that you have bad problems at home, teenager, with your brother and sister? This kid had some problems. I mean, when your brothers hate you so much that they not only tell you they hate you, which I've had, but they also threaten your life, which I've had, but they actually are about to follow through with it. I mean, that's bad. And, and Joseph gets to the point where they hate him so much that they say, I hate you, I'm gonna kill you. I was 12 years old and a uh, very smart age of my life. And I was uh, playing a game against my brother who was four years older than me. He was 16 at the time. And a uh, 12 year old kid, you know, I don't win very much against him. He beats me in basketball, he beats me in everything. And so we're sitting down and we got this game on our computer and I think it was called shark bait or something like that but it's a worm that goes around the screen and eats numbers and then uh, as you, every number that you eat the worm keeps growing and growing until you have to make sure you never run into the side walls and stuff and it's this is way i mean we're talking long 18 years ago okay so we're using the arrow keys no mouse or anything anyway so we're using arrow keys and my brother and i decide hey let's have a have a tournament so we're having a we're having this tournament on this shark game and about simultaneously about that time sega genesis the popular video game system Wow, my, this is ridiculous. Uh, anyway, Sega Genesis is the popular game system. They have this game, I think it was called NBA Jam, that one of the statements that the announcer makes is, boom shakalaka. 
If you dunk the basketball or hit a three-pointer or something, it's boom, shakalaka. And so we're playing this game, and my brother goes first, and he gets up to number like 15 or whatever, and I get 15, then I get 16 and 17. I'm like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm beating my brother. And so I'm excited about it, and the next thing I know, I'm thinking, hey, this game has shark in it, and I'm thinking of boom, shakalaka. And so I came up with boom, sharky, larky. And I, I ate the next number, boom, sharky, larky. And my brother just kind of looks at me. And so I'm playing, and I eat the next number, boom, shucky, lucky, like that. And I'm 12 years old. And he looks at me after the third time I said it, and he says, don't say it again, like that. And so, okay. <laughs> so, so I keep playing the game. A couple numbers later uh, comes an opportunity, and uh, I say it a little quieter, boom, shucky, lucky. You know, and I act like I'm looking the other way. And he said, I told you, don't say it again. You say it one more time in the famous words. I will kill you. <laughs> and, so, and so now he's, he's trying to play off my fear, and I'm 12 years old, so he's, he's doing a good job of it. And I, uh, I wait a couple turns, and uh, the next number I eat, I got it planned out what I'm going to do. And so I, uh, I get that next number, and boom, shark, lucky. And I take off running, and I got out of there. And the, the thing I didn't want to hear, I heard his footsteps following me. Man, he was chasing me. We run out the door. We run out the, uh, the we were in the, the office. We run out the office, out the back door, down out, outside. It's the summertime. I run into the garage, and there's a table in our garage. I run around the table. He's chasing me, and I make it around the table, and he comes around the table, and he steps on a, a, a wet spot on the concrete, and our concrete was real slippery when it got wet, and he stepped on that wet spot, and he, was, he didn't have his hands ready or anything, and he went, phew, feet went out from under him, and his head hit the concrete. And he gets queasy like that, and he just, he just lays back down. And I came back over, over there, and I was kind of like a little bit afraid. You know how you're like, gonna, is he alive? You know, you're, is he going to attack me? Is this a ploy? And he's, you know, he's just waiting to get me. And so I'm kind of over there, and, and after I realized, he's like, oh, man. He's like, I am going to kill you. Like, yeah, he says it again. And so I said, boom, sharky, lucky. And I took off running and got me out of there. Uh, but I was instigating. And isn't that, doesn't that sound like what Joseph's doing? You know, they get angry at him. And they're making fun of him, and he says, oh, yeah, well, guess what? I had another dream, you know, and he tells him the other dream. And it's almost like he's instigating. But he has to pursue this dream through difficulty. His brothers hate him. They envy him. They conspire against him. They want to murder him, and they think better of it, so they sell him into slavery. I mean, it can't get any worse. And for only 20 pieces of silver. Joseph's testimony in Romans 8.18 says, For I reckon, you, this is what Joseph's mentality had to become, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to, to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He had to at some point look at the dream and say, God's got a purpose, a plan, and a place for me to go, and the difficulty I'm experiencing right now, I hope it's nothing, because there needs to be some glory that's going to be revealed. And he couldn't see it at the time, but eventually he was going to see Romans 8.18 come true in his life. Moses, same instance, except Moses didn't get to see the promised land. Moses led these people and had the, God showed him where to go and what to do, and he got to the point where he was going to bring them into the promised land, and he never got to see the promise. And sometimes we look at that and think, I wonder if I would really follow through with what God has shown me if I knew I wouldn't necessarily receive the promise. Would I still do right? And Moses chose to do right. He chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Choosing rather to suffer, esteeming the approach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. And then thirdly, the faith to trust God and to trust in God's promise and rest in his presence. Look at chapter 39, if you would, in verse number 2. Chapter 39, verse 2. To trust in God's promise and rest in his presence. And the Lord was with Joseph. First verse there, Joseph was brought down to Egypt in Potiphar, an office of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian. Bought him with the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither, and the Lord was with Joseph. I can't I'm help but think, Joseph thought, the Lord has left me. I'm sitting here in Egypt. I was sold into slavery. This guy just bought me. And the Bible says in verse 2, the Lord was with him. At this point, Joseph still, yes, had those dreams in his mind, but he had to rest in God's presence. The fact that God is with us no matter what we're going through. And Joseph here has this great dream, but he has to pursue the dream through difficulty and then trust in God's promise and rest in his presence. The valiant man, when you look at the Pilgrim's Progress, Christian meets Apollyon in the way, if you remember the story. And the devil, Apollyon, spreads out over the way so he can't get through. And Christian's looking at him and trying to figure out how to get through. And he starts shooting fiery darts at him. And eventually Christian is laying on the ground and he reaches for his sword. And finally, 
thrusts through Apollyon and twice knocks him backwards, and eventually Apollyon flies away to come back at a later time. But Christian, the way that he eventually gets the victory in that point is by resting himself in that sword and that word of God. The sword, the word. The times in our life when we go through such trouble and such difficulty are the times we've got to rest heavily in God's word. Centurion who says, speak the word only. I have not seen so great faith in Israel, Christ said about him. He said, my servant's sick at home. Would you, would you heal him? Christ said, sure, here I'll come. I'll come to your house. He said, I'm not worthy to come to my house. Just speak the word only. Incredible faith in the word of God. Incredible faith in God's presence. Genesis 41, 51, Joseph came to the place where God's presence was more important than a dream of greatness and subservience by his brothers. Eventually comes a point in Genesis chapter 41. If you have your Bible there, you can look in verse 51. It says, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. This is after he's the governor. For God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. God hath made me forget. In other words, he had laid aside the, the problems with his brothers. He had laid aside all the treatment that he was given by his brothers. And he decided to forget about it all. And he came to the place where God's presence to him, God is with me, forget about the problems that I've had. He decided to rest in God's presence. And what a great time for Joseph in his life. The faith. Secondly, thir second thing I noticed in his life, the fortitude. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. The fortitude Joseph had, first of all, to endure rejection. 41.1, of course, the, another instance of how Joseph was rejected. It came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed. Behold, he stood by the river. Two years of what? Two years after he told the butler, don't forget about me. And the butler said, I won't. And he walked out the door. And two years later, there's Joseph still in prison. He's 28. He's 29. He's 30. And he's dealing with reje rejection. The fortitude, the strength, the Christian character, the Christ-likeness to be able to, to deal with the rejection that he was dealing with. I remember when I was five years old, I don't remember very well, my parents tell me the story, whether it's true or not, we'll never know. I was five years old and my brothers were playing Monopoly on the table. And uh, I kept getting up on the table and trying to play Monopoly with them, messing up the pieces, you know, knocking the houses and the hotels over, whatever. And uh, they're a bunch of babies. So they, they eventually got to the point, they got so mad at me, they, told, they yelled at me, get off the table. And, and uh, so I said, you know what, fine. You don't want me, I don't want you. So I, I walked out the door. I was five years old, and we were in Texas at the time. I just started walking, and I found a dog. Come on with me, buddy. And so me and a dog, we started, we were walking down the street. And my parents cared so much about me, they sent my sister to find me. And, uh, hey, you ran away from home. Oh, well, what's one more, you know? Uh, we still have three. So they, they sent my sister to find me and eventually found me. But what was I was dealing with that rejection. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, some are already turned aside after Satan. You know, Christ in, in, in the Lord Jesus Christ deals with rejection of, of us almost every day. The disciples, while he was here on earth, they turned away from him, left him, rejected him. Rejection is something that happens if we are Christ-like. 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas hath forsaken me, Paul said, having loved this present world. Rejection is one of those things that we have to deal with and have the fortitude to be able to handle. There is a Christ-like brotherhood for those who know the feeling of true rejection. Why? Because it was said of Christ, he was despised and rejected of men. It's going to happen. And Joseph had to take and have the fortitude to be able to stay and be able to stay true to the principles that he lived by. If we allow ourselves to do so, we can convince ourselves that not even God is with us. There are times when it feels like God has abandoned me. And those times of rejection are the times when we need to draw closer and do more to seek after his face and to find him. Secondly, the, the, um, the ability or the strength or fortitude to walk through the valley. I hate the word through in that statement. Walk through the valley. We're not on a bear hunt, and we can't go around it, and we can't go under it, and we can't go over it. The valley of the shadow of death, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the times when... When it seems death is imminent, when it, when it seems our demise is right around the corner, and we are so frustrated and we are so downtrodden that we have to understand there is, there is another side and you can get through. And Joseph had to have the fortitude to go through. It's an undesirable valley, but it's an unavoidable valley. But the great thing about the valley is that there is comfort in that valley. Verse number 2 of chapter 39, the Bible says, the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 21, same chapter, the Bible says, the Lord was with Joseph. Verse 23, same chapter, the Lord was with him. He was with him in the struggle. He was with him in the trial. 
That's the great comfort that we have in those situations. Thirdly, the fortitude to fight temptation. Chapter 39, verses 7 through 12, shows the temptation that Potiphar's wife put at Joseph. And Joseph had the ability to fight that temptation. Christ led by example in this, in this area. And he showed us how to deal with temptation. He was 40 days in a fast, afterward and hungered. And guess who came? Satan. And Satan wanted to tempt him, and Satan wanted to throw some fiery darts at him. And the first one was the lust of the flesh. I'm going to tell you what, Jesus wants to take those stones and turn them into bread. It was said that those stones actually looked like loaves of bread, the stones that were there in that region. And he said, tell you what, turn those stones into bread. And, and he said, if thou be the Son of God, the temptation of Christ. And of course, Christ's response, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He immediately takes him to the next location, to the pinnacle of the temple. And he says, if thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. Showing even the impotence of his own, you know, he couldn't even push him off. He had to tell him, cast yourself down. And Christ, again, looks at Satan, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Third temptation comes. And here, Satan takes him to a high mountain and shows him the expanse of time, basically. All the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And says, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all this. I'll relinquish my power as the, the roaring lion walking about seeking whom I may devour. You, worship, you bow down and worship me. And Christ again tells him, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And yet how many times we, not taking Christ's example, doesn't, he doesn't have to take us to the pinnacle of a temple. All he has to do is set us in the doorway of our house to be able to tempt us to the point of betraying even Christ. All he has to do is take us into our garage and show us how important Christ really is to us. All he has to do is, is put some little tawdry idol in front of us. And we have not the fortitude to resist that temptation. But Christ showed us the power of resisting that temptation in the temptations he received from Satan. What did he do all three times? He quoted the scripture. The, the power of the word of God to, to fight temptation and to fight Satan. How then can I do this great wickedness, Joseph said, and sin against God? I can't do this wickedness because I'm sinning against him. And even though Joseph was denied, he was betrayed, and he was in prison at the time, he still had the strength and fortitude to avoid the temptation. And then lastly on this, the fortitude to always do right. I had a kid, there's just a Sunday. I was in a teacher setting up chairs and a kid, blankety blank, he just, he just let it go, man. He was, he was uh, cursing over there and I said, hey, 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 watch your mouth, son. And he said, I'm sorry, it slipped. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's the famous statement, it slipped. Um, there we are uh, on an activity one time, we were doing one of those uh, where you, you take the person, there's huge poles and you take them, you pull them up and you, and you you have to like release a lever and you go and you swing. Well, there was my youth pastor and my two of the youth pastors at our church and one teenager was with them. And as soon as they let go, blankety blank blank, the kid was going crazy. And uh, they got done with it. And the, the guy asked him, what was that all about? The youth pastor asked him, what was that all about? I said, I'm sorry, it slipped. And uh, you know, the, the idea that it slipped. Joseph could have been in a situation where he could have said, I'm sorry, it's just something that, it's just something I couldn't resist. But he always had this fortitude to do right he had a Christian character about him. Actions are a performance of the heart. If your heart is true, your actions are true. If your heart is evil, your actions are evil. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, our light affliction is but for a moment. It worketh a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Do right till the stars fall. Do right till the last call. I think of the, you've probably heard the joke, the robbers in the house, burglars in the house, and he's fishing around getting stuff. And all of a sudden he hears a voice that scares him to death. I see you and Jesus sees you. He freezes. Takes a flashlight, looks around, doesn't see anything. He can, okay, maybe I'm hearing things. He continues to work. I see you and Jesus sees you. Oh boy, he's getting, now he's getting really scared. He doesn't know what's going on. And finally, he hears it one more time. I see you and Jesus sees you. And he's shining the flashlight around and he shines a flashlight on a bird in a cage. Bird's talking to him. Bird says one more time, I see you and Jesus sees you. And he says, <laughs> whatever. His light drops down just a little bit and just below the cage is the hugest, most unbelievably powerful looking Rottweiler you've ever seen in your life. And the bird says, I see you and Jesus sees you. Sick him, Jesus. <laughs> and, and there goes Jesus. And the, the idea that if, if somebody's not watching, I'll do what I want to do. And it's that character to do right no matter what and the fortitude to always do right. Another lesson I learned from Joseph, number three, 
is a lesson of forgiveness, faith, fortitude, forgiveness. Ephesians 4, 32, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Why? Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Why should I forgive? Because God's forgiven me. Chapter 50, verse 15 through 18, Joseph's brethren approach him and talk to him. And they say, his, his father has just died, please don't hurt us. And Joseph eventually gets to the point and says, why would I hurt you? You know, God, God did this. God set this up because God has forgiven me. Matthew 18 is the story of when uh, then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him till seven times. And Christ said, I sin to thee till, not until seven times, till 70 times seven. And he goes through the whole story of that, that steward who gives forgiveness unto his under servant. And that underservant goes and is, is granted forgiveness for thousands of talents and then goes and tries to recover a hundred pence from the guy just below him. And it says, you wicked, unprofitable servant, verse 35 says, likewise shall my heavenly father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Let me ask, what sin, and I ask myself, what sin is not, has God not forgiven me of? And that is the sin I cannot forgive you of. What sin is there when I ask for forgiveness for my sins that God says there's only one that I can't forgive, and it's this one? Then therefore, I can't look at you and say, then I don't forgive you for that. I have to have the ability, I have the ability to say, I forgive you. It's not based on you. It's based on what Christ has done for me. Secondly, because bitterness brings destruction. Why forgive? Because I can't become bitter. Bitterness brings destruction. Hebrews 12, 15, looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Trouble and defilement comes when bitterness comes. And if I don't want bitterness in my life, if I don't want trouble and defilement in my life, I've got to keep bitterness out of my life. Psalm 51 gives the direction of the offense. The direction is always upward. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. You didn't write the law, I didn't write the law. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. In that direction, the upward direction, we always find a way, though, somehow to make it outward. Luke 17, it is impossible that offense has come, and it talks about the forgiveness issue again. And when it's all said and done, it's probably one of the most trying things of our faith. The disciples say, increase our faith. This, this is tough. Forgiveness is a tough one. Increase our faith. But Joseph had to live the life of forgiveness. Even CNN told a story about a man named Kevin Benton who for several months was in the hospital and all of it eventually came back to the fact that he was bitter against some things taking place. A, a public CNN, I mean not even some scriptural principle that they were going off of, just saying there was bitterness in his life and it was causing him physical illness. And all of that mental health that takes place, bitterness is a nasty solvent, they said, that erodes every good thing. Why must I forgive? Thirdly, because God means it for good. Chapter 45 of verse 8 is where Joseph explains to them, You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. You need to look at the story. Why, how, why, is, why is it necessary for 13 years? You know, my humanity says, why 13 years of problems and trouble and highs and lows, you know, doing great in Potiphar's house and then in jail, and, and it's, just, it's just up and down, up and down, give him a dream, then put him in a pit, and then sell him to slavery, and then put him in charge, then put him in prison. And if you look at the story and you wonder why 13 years of that, and Joseph eventually had to throw his hands up and say, it's not, it has nothing to do with how I can figure it out because God's ways are not my ways, his thoughts are not my thoughts. The only thing I can say is God is good and God meant it for good. And there's nothing else that I can say about it. Fear, the last thing I, I noticed, faith, fortitude, forgiveness. And Joseph had fear, a reverential awe, a reverential respect that caused him to constantly fight pride. If you look at chapter 50, verse number 19, chapter 50, verse 19, the Bible says, Joseph said unto them, fear not, for am I in the place of God? rhetorical question. Am I in the place of God? Who am I to determine what happens to you? Am I in the place of God? The pride that sometimes we portray to think that, that we have to get even or that, that we have to have the knowledge and we need to understand what this is all about. And, and uh, God, doesn't, God doesn't provide that for us sometimes. It requires humility. The idea that, that I should know, that was one of the things that Satan tempted Eve with. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And she took of the fruit. There is a humility that is so many times lacking in my life and in our lives. Why does deity put on humility and humanity constantly portray pride? Deity came in the form of Jesus Christ, put on humility. 
He made himself of no reputation. Well, my reputation is, who cares? He made himself of no reputation. Put him, he, he made himself into, in the form of a servant. He served those who he created. And an incredible show and display of humility. My only recourse, my only action I can take is to fully trust and fully empty myself of me and allow for Christ to rule in me. There's no confidence in this flesh. My sufficiency is of God. I've got to trust in him. And any sort of pride that says I can handle it is going get to get me into trouble. Joseph said, this wasn't my calling. This wasn't my doing. Am I in the place of God? I, I'm not going to hurt you. That's not my job. Prayer. For us to petition heaven, for us to, for us to develop that relationship, for us to get a hold of God and say, it's not about me. I, I, want, I want you. I need you. And it is a showing of the fact that I am, I am weak, and in my weakness, he can be strong. And so I pray. He said to Peter, I have prayed for thee. He led by example. He told us when our enemies are, are mean or, or difficult or angry or awful to us, bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. We're supposed to pray. Why don't we pray? Because many times our life is full of trash. We must alter our lives in order to alter our hearts, for it is impossible to live one way and pray another. Sometimes just the trash that is in the way. Sometimes we think prayer is trivial. Corey Ten Boom said, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Is it the thing that guides you and directs you or is it the thing that bails you out when you have trouble? Prayer, why don't we pray? Sometimes we say we don't have time. John Wesley said, I have so much to do that I spend several hours in prayer before I'm able to do it. Sometimes we miss the target. Spurgeon said, there's a general kind of praying which fails for lack of precision. It is as if a regiment of soldiers should all fire their guns anywhere. Possibly somebody would be killed, but the majority of the enemy would be missed. We lean to our own understanding or we bank on service and do away with prayer. And consequently, by succeeding in the external, so I look good, we fail in the eternal. Because in the eternal, we succeed only by prevailing prayer. Those who know God the best are the richest and most powerful in prayer. Little acquaintance with God and strangeness and coldness to Him make prayer a rare and feeble thing. Let the fires go out in the boiler room of the church, and the place will look smart and clean, but it will be cold. The prayer room is the boiler room for the spiritual life. William Wilberforce, the shortening of devotions starves the soul. If you are sick, fast and pray. If the language is hard to learn, fast and pray. If the people will not hear you, fast and pray. If you have nothing to eat, fast and then pray. <laughs> what, a, what an opportunity. Intercessory prayer. God never gives us discernment in order that we may criticize, but that we, that, but that we may intercede. One should never initiate anything that he cannot saturate with prayer. Spurgeon said, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. Why do we put so much pressure on ourselves? Martin Luther said, pray, let God worry. <laughs> Why are we so, more, so worried about it? Get rid of the pride and allow humility to reign in your heart. I think of, when I, when I think of the uh, submitting myself unto God and think of submitting myself and getting rid of pride, if you'll bear with me for a second. I, uh, is this something? I presume. I brought a uh, prop with me that hopefully I'm, I'm allowed to do this. I asked my daughter if I could do this, so I'll tell a quick story here. But um, the, uh, one of the things I get to do sometimes is uh, spend a little bit of time. It's my princess chair. <laughs> um, I have a dream. The, uh, I get to spend some time every once in a while playing with my children. And my youngest daughter, Lexi, is four. And one of the things, one of the things we do is, is uh, we allow for them to every night have uh, each one, you know, one, one of the kids gets to stay up a little later than the others. And so one of, the, one of the things we often get to do is have a princess tea party. And uh, so I don't sit in that chair. Usually I, I pull a bigger chair up to the, to the table, but we'll have a princess tea party. And I don't know what I, I'm, sometimes I'm the king, sometimes I'm a prince, you know, whatever. So I, uh, I try to get into mode, but, but one of the things that she likes to do that my daughter Lexi and I, when we get to spend any time, just the two of us, is we like to play school. And, uh, and so we'll get ready for school. Dad, can we play school? Sure, I'd love to play school. And so we get all the animals out, stuffed animals are sitting everywhere, you know, all the students. And, uh, and then I get up and I say, okay, have a seat. We're going to have school. And she says, no, I'm the teacher. <sighs> okay. So, so I get in my chair and I sit in my princess chair and she comes up to start teaching. She says, okay, class, we're going to, she's like, yes. I said, um, 
I need to go to the bathroom. It's not bathroom break time. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm fine. So uh, I'll be waiting, and she say, okay, class, we're going to, and then she'll be like, what? She's getting exasperated. And uh, I'll say, uh, can I get a drink? It's not drink time. And so, okay, fine. And so I'll be sitting there, say, okay, we're going to do colors, and she'll hold up a marker. And so I'll have to call it the color. Purple, you know, here comes the next color. Blue, <laughs> green, you know. And I'm trying to as much stay into it as possible, but at some point, you know, you, I'm just rambunctious. So I'm sitting there, and she's going through class, and all of a sudden, I'll just go, boop, boop. And then I look at her, and she looks at me, and she gives this look at me, like, don't you ever do that again, you know, and she's staring at me. And so uh, we'll be sitting there again, and, and then I'll turn around, and I'll start talking to the horse. So, Mr. Ed, how are you? Everything going okay for you? And she'll, and she'll say, stop talking, and so I'll stop talking, and eventually it gets so violent, it gets so much to the point where I'll look over, and I'll talk to one of the animals, and literally she'll come over here, and she'll just slap me, you know, wham, you know, you're not allowed to slap students, you know, I'll say to her, and uh, she says, you need to be quiet, and so we're going back and forth after each other, and then it gets, it gets out of control, you know, the classroom just tends toward craziness, and and uh, eventually, the, the, I take off running out of the room, and she comes chasing me down and puts me in the corner. So now I'm not just sitting in the chair, but she puts the chair over in the corner. <laughs> and, so, and so then I got to face the wall, and she's teaching in class while I'm facing the wall, and I'll turn around. She goes, turn around. Okay. You know, so I'm sitting over here in the corner, and there's my princess chair that I get to play school with. And I got to, I got to looking at that, and you, you, know, you kind of look at that, and you wonder, now why in the world would you submit yourself to your daughter and play school with her like that and let her do that to you? Why would you submit yourself to her? And the only answer I could come up with is because I love her. That's all I got. Why would I submit myself to him? Why would I empty myself of me, of Todd Weber, and allow for the pride in my life to be emptied out? And for me to wholly trust in him because I love him. Because he loved me and I love him. And why is it that so many times we feel like we have to run in arrogance for God and so many times we neglect to walk humbly with God? And he tells us, I've shown thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. And so many times I get outside of myself. Man, I'm running for God. God, you see what I'm doing? I'm running for you. And he says, why don't you just walk humbly with me? There's so much more that we could, we could do. But you're so eager to get out there ahead of me and do what you want to do. And that pride that gets in my way. What is our reputation? I think of, in a lot of well-meaning statements, I, I've heard statements of, of what we are and who we should be and uh, the... the the statements like our, the, the greatness of our church is this, that, or the other thing. And why does, why does our, the reputation matter? Christ's reputation was meaningless. Made himself, he made himself of no reputation. Why can we not be a church? Why can I not be a Christian who is known for his humility and his humble service? Why can't I be a servant? If I'm going to be truly Christ-like, I've got to be a humble servant for God and with God. I look at all that, that Joseph was and all that Joseph did. Joseph, a man of faith. Joseph, a man of, of, of power and the ability to, to work on through the trouble that he, that he received in his life. Joseph, a man of forgiveness. And Joseph, a man who feared God, reverential trust and respect for God, who was humble in everything that he did and understood that though it looked bad for him, it really meant me and you salvation. And the, the plan of redemption continued. And Joseph got to see the salvation of his nation, of his people. And what an incredible story, what an incredible opportunity. God probably would have found somebody else to get the job done, but he allowed Joseph to do it. And one of those necessary items was that humility, that it's not me, it's him. And the faith, the fortitude, the forgiveness, and the fear. Four lessons from the life of, life of Joseph. Let's pray.